Kind of what I'll try to impress upon you today is that Bitcoin is a new technology platform. A lot of people are using it as a currency, but we're actually looking at a multitude of new uses, new use cases that it enables that you're not able to do before this technology even existed. So as for myself, uh, I'm Jameson Lopp. I graduated with a computer science degree about 10 years ago from UNC Chapel Hill. And I am a full-time software engineer for BitGo, which is a startup based in Palo Alto, California. We basically are an enterprise Bitcoin and cryptocurrency security service. So we enable other companies and entities that store and process large amounts of cryptocurrency to keep their secure uh, prevent it from getting hacked, and we build a lot of enterprise uh, budgeting and money control systems on top of the protocol to better enable companies with large numbers of people to manage their Bitcoins. So what is Bitcoin? That's really why we're here. And unfortunately, we only have an hour or so. Uh, the, the short version is Bitcoin is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, and I can not tell you what Bitcoin should be or why you should use it. I can tell you why you might be interested in it, one of the many different reasons why you might be interested in it. Um, at a fundamental level, Bitcoin as a technology is just a new type of accounting system. Uh, it happens to be an accounting ledger with unique properties in the sense that it exists on tens of thousands of machines around the world and these machines are constantly coming to a consensus on the current state of the accounting ledger. They're propagating information uh, to each other, they're validating the information, they're checking each other's work. Um, before the Bitcoin protocol was invented, pretty much everybody thought that a system like this online was impossible. And that was due to a famous problem in computer science called the Byzantine Generals problem. The problem in a nutshell is how do you coordinate amongst a distributed set of nodes to come to a consensus on the current state of a system that is also resistant to attackers who are inside the system itself who are trying to disrupt everything and undermine it and confuse you. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto is this anonymous person or group of persons who first uh, put the Bitcoin white paper out and then wrote the Bitcoin protocol back in 2008, 2009. And what they did was they developed this peer-to-peer -peer protocol that propagates data around a mesh network of nodes. It uses this newfangled blockchain data structure which creates ordered time-stamped snapshots of changes to the ledger. And then it also used something called proof of work, which is the way that we secure the ledger against computational attack. We make it very, very expensive to try to undo history, the undo the changes that happen to the ledger. Uh, that's just a really high-level, semi-technical description of what it works. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to show you a video in just a second that might make it a little more uh, easy for the layman to understand. So what is Bitcoin? Uh, well, whenever you start trying to describe what Bitcoin is, you inevitably end up going back to what is money. And it, it's one of the reasons why it's so hard to describe what it is, because a lot of people don't even understand what money is in the first place. And of course, we don't have time to go into the 5,000 year history of monetary systems. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, you know, thousands of years ago, before we even had paper money, before we even had writing and accounting systems, money was just uh, a debt that you kept in your head. You're like, you knew who owed you what based upon the trades that you had done with people. Of course, that type of system doesn't scale very well, and eventually we created writing and accounting systems. And from that point on, money has changed from a technological standpoint of how we keep track of who owes who what. But at the end of the day, money is debt. Money is, I owe you this because we exchanged some good or service, and how are we going to keep track of who owes who what? Um, so 
the media will will cover Bitcoin usually only when the price goes up a lot or goes down a lot, uh, or when there's some sort of government crackdown. Uh, they generally focus on Bitcoin as a volatile or even renegade underground uh, technology or currency. And I think this is very distracting uh, and is actually resulting in a lot of people completely missing the potential long-term significance of this disruptive new technology. At the moment, the most widespread usage of Bitcoin is as a currency, which was Satoshi Nakamoto's original goal. If you read the white paper, he was trying to create an electronic cash system. Uh, people have realized that there is utility and value in this type of system that enables you to prove and transfer the ownership of entries in a public accounting ledger without requiring trusted third parties. And this perceived value and utility is what results in the free floating exchange rate of a unit of Bitcoin, which is currently going for around $900 or $1,000. Uh, now don't be dissuaded by that very high figure because Bitcoin coins themselves are uh, divisible into eight decimal places, so you can buy 10 cents, a dollar, $20, whatever you need if you are going to be using it for a transactional purpose. Um, of course, it can be very difficult to convince people that Bitcoin is even usable as money, especially if they don't understand how money itself works. Most people just uh, take for granted that you have your dollars and your credit cards and you just use it and you don't worry about all of the layers of technology that are actually underpinning uh, those systems. So. In this presentation, we'll, we'll go over some of the technology, but really want to spend a lot of time identifying potential new applications and exploring the potential impact of the things that we can build on top of it. So Bitcoin was originally uh, came out in January 3rd, 2009. So I guess we just had the eighth birthday. And over just these eight years, I think we've seen that a lot of innovation and disruption is already occurring in this space. And uh, based upon what I'm seeing when I go out to Silicon Valley and seeing the venture capital that's flowing into it, all of the talent that's flowing into this space, I think over the next few years we're going to see a lot more interesting things uh, appear in this industry. So how does Bitcoin work? This is mostly non-technical. Uh, Hopefully, the sound will work. What if there's a technological advancement so powerful that it transforms the very basic pillars of our society? A technology which fundamentally influences the way that our economy, government systems, and businesses function, and could change our conceptual understanding of trade, ownership, and trust. This technology already exists, and it's called cryptocurrency. People often think of Bitcoin as only virtual money or a transaction system. But if you look closer, you'll see that the monetary aspect is just the tip of the iceberg. That's because Bitcoin is a groundbreaking internet technology for which money is merely one of the possible applications. Money exists to facilitate trade. Through the centuries, trade has become incredibly complex. Everyone trades with everyone worldwide. Trade is recorded in bookkeeping. This information is often isolated and closed to the public. For this reason, we use third parties and middlemen we trust to facilitate and approve our transactions. Think of governments, banks, accountants, notaries, and the paper money in your wallet. We call these trusted third parties. This brings us to the essence of Bitcoin. Bitcoin software enables a network of computers to maintain a collective bookkeeping via the internet. This bookkeeping is neither closed nor in control of one party. Rather, it is public and available in one digital ledger which is fully distributed across the network. We call this the blockchain. In the blockchain, all transactions are logged, including information on the time, date, participants, and amount of every single transaction. Each node in the network owns a full copy of the blockchain. On the basis of complicated, state-of-the-art mathematical principles, the transactions are verified by the so-called Bitcoin miners, who maintain the ledger. The mathematical principles also ensure that these nodes automatically and continuously agree about the current state of the ledger and every transaction in it. If anyone attempts to corrupt a transaction, the nodes will not arrive at a consensus, 
and hence will refuse to incorporate the transaction in the blockchain. So every transaction is public, and thousands of nodes unanimously agree that a transaction has occurred on date X at time Y. It's almost like there's a notary present at every transaction. This way, everyone has access to a shared single source of truth. This is why we can always trust the blockchain. The ledger doesn't care whether a Bitcoin represents a certain amount of euros or dollars, or anything else of value, or property for that matter. Users can decide for themselves what a unit of Bitcoin represents. A Bitcoin is divisible in a hundred million units, and each unit is both individually identifiable and programmable. This means that users can assign properties to each unit. Users can program a unit to represent a euro cent, or a share in a company, a kilowatt hour of energy, or a digital certificate of ownership. Because of this, Bitcoin is much more than simply money and payments. A Bitcoin can represent many kinds of property, a thousand barrels of oil, award credits, or a vote during elections, for example. Moreover, Bitcoin allows us to make our currency smarter and to automize our cash and money flows. Imagine a healthcare allowance in dollars or euros that can only be used to pay for healthcare at certified parties. In this case, whether someone actually follows the rules is no longer verified in the bureaucratic process afterwards. You simply program these rules into the money. Ergo, compliancy up front. The unit can even be programmed in such a way that it will automatically return to the provider if the receiver doesn't use it after a certain amount of time. This way, the provider can ensure that allowances are not hoarded. A company can control its spending in the same way by programming budgets for salaries, machinery, materials, and maintenance so that the respective money is specified and cannot be spent on other things. Automizing such matters leads to a considerable decrease in bureaucracy, which saves accountants, controllers, and the organization in general an incredible amount of time. The programmable open character of Bitcoin allows us to completely rebuild and innovate our financial sector and our administrative processes, make them more efficient and transparent, and significantly decrease bureaucracy. But there's more. In an Internet of Things, our economy will be dealing with machines that actively participate in the economic traffic. In fact, they're already here. Think of a vending machine, or drones delivering packages. These machines are unfamiliar with the concept of trust, but Bitcoin is not. Because of Bitcoin, the drone can be 100% certain that it will deliver the package to the right recipient and know for sure that it's been paid for. And we can program the vending machine in such a way that it will automatically keep track of its supplies, order new supplies from the supplier, and pay for them automatically. Of course, you'll understand that this is only the beginning. Internet technology is disruptive and breaks the status quo. It opens markets and breaks the positions of middlemen all the time. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have caused a paradigm shift. It's time to explore this new technology constructively and critically and openly discuss potential applications. So I really like the uh, description of uh, this type of system as sort of uh, bureaucracy or you know, automation uh, of bureaucracy. Um, while you, you may see um, a lot of people referring to, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as uh, you know, digital money, I think it's almost better to, to think of it as the internet of money. It's, it's creating this new system uh, where we can create new rules that, that we decide with other people to agree with to uh, use the new functionality for whatever use we want. So that's why it can, it can seem really wishy-washy of well, what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is whatever type of system you want to build on top of it that you can agree with other people has some sort of use. So, the, of course, the initial system being people are using it just to transfer value back and forth. Uh, but let's go into some of the uh, other many interesting uses that are coming up. Let's see. All right. Um, 
So why would you want to use Bitcoin? Uh, if you're just using it as cash, you might want to use it because it's faster than a lot of things. Like if you want to do a wire transfer to some other country, I can tell you from experience you're going to have to go into the bank and spend about half an hour there filling out paperwork and, uh, and then wait you know, three to five business days. You might hear three to five business days happens a lot in the uh, financial world, whereas with Bitcoin you're looking at more on the order of 10 to 20 minutes to have a finalized, settled transaction. Um, now, it can, in certain instances, be more convenient to use than credit cards. Uh, I find that it's really best suited for online purchases. So you're probably familiar with going to a website and then having to enter in your 16-digit credit card number and your home address and all the other verification information, which can be a bit of a pain if it's not a site that you use very often and haven't stored your uh, details there, whereas I find that going and just scanning a QR code and immediately paying, especially if it's for a digital good that I'm not having shipped to my address, you can just skip over all of that process of, of putting in your personally identifying information. Um, on a related note, this is a different type of payment system in, in, in that you are pushing value to whoever you're sending it to, rather than having them pull value from you. The big difference is if you give someone your credit card information, you're essentially giving them the keys to your kingdom. Once they have that information, they can pull however much money they want to from your credit card account. Uh, this is one of the reasons why credit cards are so insecure, is because every merchant that you're going to and creating a relationship with you're also having to trust their security practices. So you see what happens when you have like Target or Best Buy or whatever get breached. Now the, the finance companies have to go and issue millions of new credit cards. And you know that is not a low cost proposition. The, all of the costs that these companies are having to pay to, to patch up their systems and, and fix um, fraud and security issues uh, are getting paid for by the consumers and the merchants uh, in forms of fees. So as a, a result, merchants may prefer receiving Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because they're not having to pay those fees. In Bitcoin, there are some small fees, but they're actually paid by the sender. Um, on a related note, there are no chargebacks. Good for merchant, possibly not as good for consumer. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but you find that a lot of merchants, um, on top of just the credit card fees they pay in uh, certain industries, the chargeback rates can be extremely high. And that, of course, cuts into merchants' profit. And they have to pass those uh, prices on to the consumers if they're having, say, like 10 to 20% chargebacks. Um, because they tend to, the, the credit card companies pretty much always side with consumers if they do a chargeback for almost any reason. Um, also, the identity theft issue is no longer an issue because you're not sending all of your, your uh, financial information to every merchant that you're interacting with. Uh, there's also a, a much better uh, ability for you to be private or anonymous uh, if you know what you're doing. Yes? I always hear that it's more private, but if it's a public ledger, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit of both, in that in, in order for Bitcoin to be secure and everyone to be checking each other's work, you do have to have some of the details be public, so that you're actually able to verify the, the cryptographic keys that are being used and verify that people are not creating money out of nowhere or they're not double spending uh, the same money. Uh, but on the flip side, no one's actual identities are on the blockchain so in the know database. What is it they don't know what you mean. What is Oh, well, even if you're just looking at the blockchain itself, you can't see that someone even paid it to target. All you see is one really long 30-digit alphanumeric uh, account transferred this amount to this other 30-some digit alphanumeric account. Um, there are ways that you can start trying to do analysis and pull in other data sources from outside of the blockchain to start correlating uh, and finding identities. And there are entire companies that are doing that. Um, but it's, it's just like any online privacy issue. There, there are people 
who are creating tools to enable privacy, and there are other people who are creating tools to strip away privacy. We don't want that to be private. We want to her. That and, yeah. and people who are, are yeah, trying to, yeah. or and yeah, people who are trying to do fraud analysis yeah. is, is one of the big reasons. Um, and, and I guess one of the big differences between this and most other digital money is that it's really more like digital cash. So if you hold it, it's yours. If someone else holds it, then it's not yours. So uh, if, for example, you're going and creating a, a wallet at a custodial provider uh, like uh, Coinbase, for example, uh, they're actually a Bitcoin bank. So if you have Bitcoins in Coinbase, they're actually Coinbase's coins, like they have the private cryptographic keys to them. They don't really become yours from a technical standpoint until you withdraw them into your own wallet on your phone, your computer, what have you. Um, this is the uh, be your own bank aspect of Bitcoin. You don't have to be your own bank. You can definitely let someone else be your bank. But then you're running uh, the risk, of course, of them either getting hacked or stealing your money or uh, really any any of the, the problems that come with using, using an actual bank to hold on to your value. Uh, you know, with us in the United States, we have pretty good banking infrastructure. You don't see too many bank runs or uh, bank uh, you know, shutdowns today. Uh, you know, we saw a number of them back in 2008. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a non-zero risk, though we are certainly in a better position than a lot of citizens in other countries uh, just look at Argentina or Venezuela, for example, uh, who are having a lot of uh, issues with their monetary system. Um, and then also, uh, there are no banking hours. Uh, as long as you have an internet connection, you can use Bitcoin. There are actually a few interesting ways you can use it without having an internet connection. Um, and of course, there's no issuing authority. There's no one who can confiscate your money or inflate the monetary supply and, and thus devalue your money. Um, the monetary supply is very well known and fixed, algorithmically set as part of the protocol. Um, and also there's, there's no arbitrary restrictions on what you can do with it. So um, a lot of people describe this as a censorship resistant system. If you create a valid Bitcoin transaction, the, cryptogra the cryptography uh, matches and the, uh, the entries in the ledger that you're manipulating are valid, then there's no one who can look at that and say, oh, I don't like you know, what you're doing and, and block it. Um, there are you know, so many thousands of different machines running around the network, you only have to get them your transaction onto one of those machines for it to propagate to the rest of the network. Uh, and Something that we'll get into more is the, the non-currency uses. If you're really looking at this as more of a data store than a digital currency, there are a lot of interesting things you can start to build on top of it. Why would you not want to use Bitcoin? Well, for us, uh, the dollar is one of the top uh, you know, most stable, most powerful currencies in the world. So we're not that particularly worried about the dollars in our bank account becoming worthless overnight. In fact, if you're storing your wealth in Bitcoin, you can be pretty much assured to see fluctuations as much as 10 to 15% in a single day. Um, this can be good or bad. It can go up, it can go down. Uh, it's generally a wild roller coaster. Um, from an investment standpoint, it would be analogous to investing in like a penny stock. Uh, there's only about 16 or 17 billion dollar market cap for like the entire sum value of all the Bitcoins in existence. Also, fairly high learning curve, at least if you want to be uh, well versed in the security aspects of it. Um, I would recommend, if, if you want to get into it, just buy 20 bucks worth. That way, if you screw something up, then OK, you're out 20 bucks. No big deal. I uh, would not advise going and buying thousands of dollars uh, unless you have done you know, months and months of research and are really comfortable with using the system and securing your own uh, cryptographic keys. Is this something that you've utilized yourself? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I so use. Practicing what you preach. Yeah, um, and I mean, I've been using Bitcoin since 2012, so. I've, I've got a lot more experience with it. Um, and of course, as a programmer, 
I've, I've written a lot of like really low level uh, Bitcoin scripts and, and functionality. Um, and when I, want, when I want to do crazy experimental stuff, I actually use the Bitcoin test network so that if, if I screw something up, then those aren't even you know, real money. Uh, they have no value. Um, of course, the, the upside to being your own bank is that um, no one can tell you how to access your money. The downside is now the security onus falls onto you. So uh, that's one of the things you do hear a lot about is you know, Bitcoin exchange, whatever got hacked. Uh, a lot of times the news will say Bitcoin is dead because you know, some company got hacked. But there's a big difference between um, an entity that owns Bitcoins getting hacked and the Bitcoin protocol itself getting hacked. There's a lot of conflating of those two things that happens in the mainstream media. So to be clear, the Bitcoin protocol itself has never been hacked, um, which is a pretty amazing thing. If it was hacked, you could pretty much guarantee that the, the price would plummet very quickly. But it's also its own bug bounty from that standpoint, where right now, like I said, there's something like $17 billion worth of value stored in this system globally. If you can figure out a way to hack the protocol level, then you could very easily become a multimillionaire overnight. So there's a great incentive for people to try to break the protocol, exploit it, find weaknesses in it. And a lot of people, a lot of well-known hackers uh, have tried to do that. Um, some of them, in fact, uh, have spent months and months dedicated to trying to find a flaw and, and ultimately had to give up. So that's one of the reasons why we're so confident in the protocol itself is because after all these years and all of this continual value flowing into it, all of the hacks are happening above the protocol layer. They're, they're ha happening to people who are storing their cryptographic keys in an insecure manner. We find that all the hackers are going for companies and, and websites that are storing it rather than trying to do the protocol itself because that is a much bigger payoff. Um, and of course, if you're using a currency, uh, currency is only worth what other people will exchange you uh, stuff for. So if you're you know, going to the mall and trying to buy stuff with Bitcoins, you're going to have uh, a tough time. Though, if you're looking to buy things online, there are probably tens of thousands, if not a couple hundred thousand different websites now that do accept Bitcoin. Um, so there are quite a few places that you can spend it, uh, especially online. Um, Bigger names would be like Microsoft, Dell, Overstock, uh, and a lot of the geeky websites, of course, uh, that have been accepting Bitcoin as a payment for several years. And as for like chargebacks, consumer protection, uh, that's one of the pot potential downsides for the user is that if you're not really that trusting in whoever you're interacting with, you probably want to use some sort of escrow agent. And there are a number of services that uh, allow for that. And finally, um, if catastrophe strikes, then there's probably not very much that you can do if you lose your money. Um, that's one of the downsides to to hacking in this system, and the reason why security is actually much more paramount than with credit cards, where if something goes wrong with the credit card, then the company just steps in, reverses the transaction, and, and everything's good from your standpoint. Whereas we need to be better upfront with security and prevent that from happening in this type of system. And so these are just like a, a list of a few different types of people that I found are interested in this type of system. <coughs> Um, we already talked about merchants and consumers a fair amount. Uh, now, as for like immigrants, uh, we've actually got a huge uh, volume that is occurring uh, with remittances these days. I'm seeing a lot of remittances going to uh, Philippines, India, Mexico, mainly because Bitcoin is a lot cheaper and a lot faster than Western Union. Uh, if if you can find a, a company that already is doing remittances into uh, one of those countries because you still have to have boots on the ground, uh, so to say, uh, in order to do the actual uh, exchange in whatever country you're sending the money to. 
Uh, for citizens living in countries with insane inflation and strict capital controls, um, look at Argentina, China, Venezuela. Uh, we're seeing a lot of adoption there. Uh, it's really, these are the people who need Bitcoin more than you and I, at least as a currency or as a store of value. Um, for investors and traders, it's high risk, high reward, speculative commodity. Uh, for cryptographers, it's an interesting application of a lot of the concepts in this field and a platform for new experimentation with regard to distributed systems and consensus. Um, for software engineers such as myself, it's a very interesting new programmable system of rules and bureaucratic automation. Uh, for, econ um, for economists, a lot of traditional economists hate Bitcoin. Uh, and that's because you'll find that the prevailing school of thought is Keynesian economics, whereas Bitcoin really takes more of an Austrian economic school of thought, um, which creates a lot of contention there uh, between people of different uh, economic theories. But we're going to see uh, you know, what, how it plays out over the coming years. For uh, innovators, it's a way that they can crowdfund ideas without needing approval from financial institutions or traditional crowdfunding sites. Uh, there are innumerable examples over the years of various efforts that have tried to use PayPal or other systems to crowdfund their ideas and ended up getting kicked off of those platforms because they didn't meet the terms of service or they pissed somebody off. With Bitcoin, you don't have to get permission from anyone. For libertarians and anarchists, it's freedom from uh, state monopoly on the monetary system. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons I got into it originally, uh, including the interesting computer science properties. It's just that I felt that money is a concept that belongs to people as a whole, and that it should be something that we agree upon how it works, not necessarily something that a few people behind closed doors at you know, a central bank or on a board of, of some uh, uh, government regulatory body get to decree to us how the system should work. Um, I haven't really spoken too much about um, the, the human level of consensus in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but it's better to think of it, it's not so much a democracy as it is a voluntary system of rules. So the software itself is open source. Absolutely anybody is free to join one of the Bitcoin protocol projects uh, and start contributing code, start proposing new rules, rule changes, uh, improvements. Um, it's really a collaborative system, both at the coding level and then at the deployment level of trying to get the rules activated. Uh, so in, in order to make changes to the system, first you have to write the code, but then you have to convince everyone in the system to upgrade to, to use your code before it actually becomes active. Uh, it, it is, it's created a very interesting new type of political arena. Where, whereas you know, we are used to seeing a sort of like 50% uh, representative democracy of whichever idea has 51% basically gets forced on the other 49%. In Bitcoin, it really has to be more like 95, 96, 97% uh, before a, uh, a new rule change can get implemented. And then for the miners, it's, it's a way for them to legally mint money. Uh, and for attorneys, it's looking to become a new method of proving ownership of assets and writing smart contracts. So it's the programmable aspect of this. Of if, if you look at the ways uh, attorneys basically create contracts that are sets of rules, we can, in fact, create programmable contracts that get executed on this type of system. So. I think there's, there's a lot of stuff, these are just a few things that are going on right now where like we said, the privacy aspect is kind of touch and go. There are a lot of people working on better privacy at a cryptographic level. Uh, we're seeing all types of new apps, uh, games, gambling, um, even seeing stuff like uh, trying to do digital content right management. Um, people who are trying to replace existing systems, like the, the domain name system, which is controlled by ICANN, which is this global body 
which was really mostly controlled by the United States, at least up until recently. Um, we're seeing distributed markets. We're seeing an interesting new concept uh, that's being called like autonomous corporations, which is the idea of, well, if you think of a company or a corporation as a set of rules of how they operate, what if we can recreate those type of rules and run on this type of system? So uh, a kind of far future idea would be, well, you have self-driving cars. That's already becoming a reality. We have this digital currency. Um, what if your self-driving cars could actually operate themselves, uh, receive digital currency from the, the fares, and then pay for their own repairs, gas, fuel, what have you, with that same digital currency, just via a set of rules that essentially duplicate what a human would be doing if they were the taxi driver. Um, also, voting systems people are working on. And then this is the, the more programmable aspect, is just general scripting of events, uh, triggering events, which would require some sort of oracle that is you know, looking for, for some sort of data existing in the world, and then triggering a, a programmatic uh, payment, for example, as a result. Um, to try to go into a little bit more idea of like how this car example might work. Um, so if you're thinking about complex asset transfers, uh, for example, a car purchase. If you have to go buy a car right now, you have to engage a third party to actually do the title transfer. And also, if you want to look at the car's accident and inspection history, you have to go to another third party who has that history. Who doesn't like spending a day at the DMV you know, trying to get all of that stuff worked out? If instead, you could have a blockchain run system like this, then the entries in the blockchain would be representative of your real world assets, such as your car. And you would use the functionality of the system to transfer and prove ownership of that asset simply using a device like your smartphone or your computer. Um, the system itself would record the entire history of past ownership and the history of the property and upon purchasing the car, you could verify that history and transfer the title um, without having to go wait in line and then get someone to sign off on it. So the, the real name of the game here is disintermediation. So if there's any type of economic interaction that you can think of right now that requires a trusted third party to broker, then a blockchain-based system could give you some efficiency there by essentially getting rid of the third party. Now, the, the real hard part here is creating the network effect of you have to get other people to agree with you that this is the system that we need to use. So it's definitely going to be tricky to uh, do a transition from the existing type of system to a blockchain-based system uh, because the value of those grows with the size of the network. Uh, much like currency uh, itself right now. Uh, from a contract standpoint, um, you know, contracts are usually developed by lawyers on a case-by-case -case basis with significant resources devoted to negotiating and developing them. And there are also other types of contracts, though, especially in finance, where you're looking at like derivatives markets. Um, those type of contracts tend to be a lot simpler but they usually lack transparency and it complicates the regulatory market because the regulators can't necessarily see what's going on behind the scenes. So if we're looking at traditional contacts, we can, contracts can be replaced by code that self-executes when a triggering event occurs. For a simple example, a financial instrument like an option could be developed and executed over a blockchain this would reduce the legal fees and, and human resources required to actually execute it and also bring new transparency to the financial markets because regulators could just look at the public ledger to understand what was going on in the market without necessarily forcing the individual actors to reveal their specific positions. 
Um, interestingly, Patrick Byrne of Overstock.com just launched a company called T0 that is essentially trying to do this. Uh, it's a, a trading platform where the settlement occurs almost instantaneously rather than taking about three business days. Um, well, there's a couple different ways. Either you can use your completely a completely new, different blockchain, uh, which then has security implications, um, it can be a little bit trickier to set up, or um, you, or yeah, you can attach it to you know point zero 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 one uh, the value, so so that the currency value is negligible, and you're really just denoting that it is an asset in the ledger. And anyone else who's looking at the ledger probably ha will have no idea what you're even doing with it. They're only seeing tiny amounts of value being transferred around. They don't necessarily even know what it represents. All you really care is that the people that you want to understand what it represents do understand. And that would just be more an, uh, an issue of you running the same software. Um, as for like identity management, uh, some people are, are looking at this from the, the standpoint of like passports, which really still operate on a paper-based system for your users who are carrying them around. The uh, passports are often forged and stolen. Uh, Interpol's database actually currently lists about 40 million stolen travel documents. So what if there was a way where we could create a unique, verifiable key that was impossible to forge? And using a cryptographic network such as Bitcoin or some other blockchain could be used to verify your identities and monitor your movements across borders, where if you travel through a checkpoint at a border crossing, instead of showing and scanning a paper passport with its various encoded data, you can instead use your smartphone, your computer, to sign a message with whatever your private cryptographic key is that proves who you are. Uh, a network could then be maintained by governments, contractors, or other entities that verify your cryptographic signature and then register an entry into that ledger. And this system, which would be based upon cryptography rather than paper documents, would increase both your mobility and your security. Uh, if a blockchain could be used for passports, for example, then it could also be used for any other type of system, like social security, uh, tax identification documents, uh, driver's licenses, what have you. Looking a little bit more at uh, things that already exist, one of the first things that we saw in Bitcoin was actually provably fair gambling. Um, these sites were incredibly easy to use, didn't even require accounts to sign up. All you would have to do is choose a Bitcoin address on the uh, site that corresponds to your level of gambling risk, send the coins to it, and within a few seconds you would receive a transaction back that would either be more than your original amount or less, depending on if you won or lost. That in, it, in and of itself might not sound very interesting, but the interesting part was that these games were provably fair because before you even made the bet, it would present you with a cryptographic hash of the secret information that was going to be used to calculate whether or not you won or lost your gamble. After you made your bet and then either won or lost, the secrets would then be presented to you that you could verify against the cryptographic hash. So this is something that you don't really see if you go to Vegas or if you're using any of those uh, video gaming gambling machines. Whenever you're doing that, you're really having to trust that they're uh, honestly uh, screwing you over when you're gambling. Whereas here, you can actually uh, verify it cryptographically. Uh, also, uh, looking back at identity and reputation systems, there are uh, a number of systems that are already out there. Uh, BitID is one way where you can uh, authenticate yourself logging into web services, where instead of using a username and password, you're signing a message with a Bitcoin private key. Um, so all you really have to do is scan a QR code with the app, and it will handle the signatures on the back end. Uh, reputation systems are, are becoming more important in Bitcoin because, like I said, it's a push-only system with no revocation if anything goes wrong. Um, 
Bitrated is one system that is building reputations where essentially you're creating a web of trust and uh, connecting to other people in the system and rating them. Uh, web of trust is a concept that's been around for quite a while. Uh, but this is really pulling Bitcoin into the web of trust where you can also set up a multi-signature like escrow contracts where you want to buy something from someone that you don't trust and they might not have a great rating, but then you can find someone who has built up a great reputation as an escrow agent and use them to help facilitate whatever transaction you're doing. Um, and then there on the right is a service called OneName and they basically allow you to link all of your different online profiles together um, cryptographically by posting proofs cryptographic proofs on each of your social media uh, accounts, which it then ingests. And it then takes all of those cryptographic proofs and sort of sums them up into a new cryptographic proof, which it stores on the Bitcoin blockchain, which becomes your like historical record. Um, you can see my one name profile over there. And uh, it's completely free and I found quite easy to, to set up your own. Uh, I kind of use that as my my online business card, if you will, so that people know that like those are the accounts that belong to me and any other accounts that I haven't attested to are probably fake. Uh, proof of existence is an interesting concept. Uh, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with like digital rights management or digital attestation of, of ownership of, uh, of just data. Essentially, what proof of existence does is it allows you to take any digital file you want and it uh, creates a hash, which is just a short, seemingly random uh, string of letters and numbers. It then uh, takes that hash and puts it into the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a simp essentially it's creating a time stamped uh, proof. A permanent record that you created this unique document at this time. But to the rest of the world who's looking at the Bitcoin blockchain, it's just a meaningless hash of data. But if at some point in the future you want to prove that you created this content uh, at the current time, so for example, if there's some intellectual property dispute, then all you have to do is provide your original document and the hashing function that you used and you can prove with like cryptographic certainty that you created the document at a certain time. And that, without going into too much detail of how the cryptographic hashing works, um, it essentially creates a fingerprint of the document that is easy to reproduce but um, computationally expensive slash impossible for someone to, to recreate if all they have is the hash. Uh, there's actually a company called Factum that's building an entire infrastructure around this model, uh, essentially maintaining permanent time stamped uh, records of data in their blockchain. Uh, one way that they tried to display the power of their system as a contrived example is they hashed the entire contents of Project Gutenberg which is about 28,000 books and stored the hashes of them uh, in Bitcoin with only about four transactions. We've also got some systems where people are trying to build new types of internet infrastructure. Uh, one of those is Namecoin which is trying to build a new type of domain name systems. Uh, it was essentially a clone of Bitcoin with about 400 lines of code changed. Um, more interesting, in fact, today is on the right, uh, Blockstack is a company which just today announced that they raised $4 million in funding. They're essentially trying to build a new decentralized internet infrastructure where you can build applications that don't even require a server to run and they use the blockchain as their backend data store while running the application uh, directly inside your browser. Uh, that creates some interesting new properties in terms of being uh, robust. Uh, you know, if there's no server to attack, uh, then you don't have to worry about like operational issues on that uh, standpoint. I can tell you that 
running uh, a well-known service can be a pain, both from a, a scalability standpoint, but also from an attack standpoint where denial of service attacks are fairly trivial for people who know how to do them to, to pull off. Uh, and they keep getting worse and worse over time, so it's very difficult to protect your service against uh, denial of service attacks. Now, if you've ever sold anything on eBay, then you're probably well aware that they take a pretty decent uh, cut of, of whatever you're selling. I want to say it's maybe 5 to 10%, if not more. Of course, eBay also owns PayPal, and they take another cut when you actually receive the money. Uh, Open Bazaar is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized marketplace where you run the software and you become your own node, your own store on this decentralized network. Um, that gives you a number of, of interesting new properties. One of them is privacy. No one necessarily has to know who you are. You can sell things fairly anonymously. Um, also, this is another open source project, so anyone can review the code, uh, join the project, make improvements to it. A third is there are no fees. Uh, open Bazaar itself does not charge anything to use its software, nor do they charge you any fees. You only need to pay the Bitcoin transaction uh, fees, which are usually about 10 to 20 cents for a transaction. Um, you know, contrasted to paying a percentage of what you're earning from your sales, it's uh, very negligible fees. And then finally, it's once again, it's about freedom, where there's no one who can censor you and tell you, you know, what you're allowed to sell uh, or who you're allowed to do business with. Anyone who gets onto this network is, is free to interact economically with other people. Then we have some prediction markets, which uh, you know, mostly used for gambling, but can also be used for forecasting, uh, for example, like political events. Um, we can, we've got a few different systems. Uh, one of the, the one that really seems to be the furthest along is called Augur, and it's actually built on top of Ethereum, which is a, um, a different type of cryptocurrency that has a lot more functionality than Bitcoin in terms of like programmability. Um, Augur essentially allows its users to create any type of predictive marketplace where the users can create markets, they can provide liquidity for the prediction markets, they can also earn fees by like, correctly forecasting outcomes of predictions. Um, crowdfunding is also something that I mentioned earlier where uh, there are now various different types of platforms you can use to Crowdfund whatever idea you want. And you can even, you know, using the programmable aspects of these blockchains, uh, create uh, a programmable contract where if you don't reach a certain funding percentage, everybody gets refunded uh, if they had uh, pledged anything to your project. There are also a number of projects underway that are building uh, decentralized cloud storage platforms that can't be censored or monitored or even have downtime. So they're using blockchain features uh, for the security, but they're also using uh, sort of encrypted, sharded cloud storage strategies to use regular people's hard drives as the uh, virtual hard drive for your own purposes. So these various solutions make it so that you don't have to trust a company like uh, Amazon or Microsoft or whoever's running your cloud service um, or even the employees behind those services because all of the data gets automatically encrypted before it's stored anywhere out on the internet. Um, so the, the decentralized aspect of this means that there are no more services to be compromised and really you can be sure that you're the only one who has access uh, to your data if you want to share it. There are also some people that are building a decentralized stock exchange. Uh, there was Patrick Byrne with his uh, T0, but here we have a screenshot of BitShares, which is using its own blockchain 
And essentially, they're allowing people to trade different crypto tokens back and forth, where all you have to do is install this software, and you once again become your own node on this new network, and can interact with other people who are on that network. And then the Internet of Things is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general is that now we can actually have machines owning money and interacting with each other economically. So the idea of combining blockchain technology with the Internet of Things is that you would enable smart devices to economically interact with each other and perform actions such as self-maintenance. Uh, one example uh, that IBM actually built a year ago is they had a proof of concept washing machine that could sense when maintenance was required, go out onto the internet, select a repair contract, and then pay the repair company once the service had been completed and its own you know, self-diagnostic system had uh, determined that it was done correctly. Uh, the more futuristic example was kind of like that taxi cab uh, analogy that I was talking about where the, uh, the smart cars could drive themselves around and, and pay for whatever maintenance they need from the money that they collected from fares. Um, IBM is probably on the forefront of doing the Internet of Things blockchain uh, mashup. They've got a couple different projects. Uh, one of them is called Blue Horizon. Another one is called uh, Watson Internet of Things Lab Services. And then we've also got a company that is really uh, more Bitcoin based that's called 21, where they're building new types of micropayment networks uh, that use Bitcoin. And one of the things that I've been trying to, to get across to you, you know, there's many different ways that, that you can use this technology. And so even, even today, just in you know, the past few weeks, we see articles come out on mainstream media, you know, Forbes, uh, Financial Times, uh, really any of the big news uh, organizations. People that are saying that you know Bitcoin is still for people who want to skirt around the law, they want to evade taxes, they want to do illegal things. Um, yes, yes, Bitcoin is good for that because uh, because it has this censorship resistant property. But you actually find that this is the case for any new emergent technology. Uh, criminals tend to latch on to the forefront of technology because law enforcement isn't there yet. And this is, a, this is true throughout history. Go back as far as you want. Um, the same thing happened with the internet back in the 90s. Um, a lot of uh, activity that was happening back then was pretty sketchy. I mean, in fact, you look at technological adoption in general, I think you find like the adult industry tends to adopt new technology faster than a lot of other industries. So. Yes, uh, Bitcoin is used for illegal things. Uh, so is the dollar. I don't think it's you know necessarily something that makes this system bad. The the system itself is quite neutral. It doesn't really care what you're using it for. Um, then of course there's also a lot of people who are still really hung up on the idea that money is something that is is sort of bestowed upon the citizens of a country by its government. And while that has been mostly true for the past few hundred years, historically, that's not true. It's, it's really more of a recent development in human history that monetary systems have been controlled by a small number of people. Um, I mean, you can look at gold, for example, which was really uh, one of the most popular uses uh, for medium of exchange for thousands of years. No one really controls gold; it just is. And might you just something that's easier to carry around than your goat? Sure. I mean, you know, you might not want my goat. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, mean, I have to sell the goat to her so that I can get her puppy. Would you rather have a puppy? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one thing that I, I find interesting. A lot of, and I think a lot of educational institutions still propagate this myth which is that before there was money, everyone just bartered with each other. But I think if you 
actually look at history, you'll be very hard pressed to find an example of a civilization that was entirely barter based. And it's because of the double coincidence of wants. Like, if you have a goat and, and I have some bread, it's great if I want some of your goat milk and you want some of my bread, but, but if I want your goat milk and you don't want my bread, then we've got a problem. Right. Yeah, you have to find some every year or something. So, so for a long time, uh, I think people just kept it in their heads who owed what, and then we started developing the tally systems, and then we started developing writing and accounting systems, and it's been an evolution of technology. Um, but I think the question of whether or not a, a government or a central bank is really required for a you know, stable monetary system uh, is highly debatable. And we're, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens in the coming years. Um, I know that historically, you look at, at any government-based monetary system and uh, just like governments themselves, they don't last forever. Um, eventually, it's going to fall and be replaced by something else. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how long Bitcoin lasts in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but like I said, it's already been declared dead 120 times by a number of different experts, economists, computer scientists, uh, bankers, government officials. And it keeps defying the, the will of a lot of these uh, traditional system people that, that it's going to necessarily fail. From my perspective, uh, Bitcoin, it's a community. Uh, the people who want to see it succeed are going to continue working on improving it. It's not a perfect system, but it's a system that can evolve. And it's going to continue evolving in the way that is best for everyone who is currently involved in it. So I have a, I have a lot of faith in the, the process for you know, how we determine the direction of the system and how it's going to evolve over the coming years. Um, especially because, like I, I note here, it did not spontaneously appear out of nowhere. If you actually look into the history of the, the people who have been working on these type of systems, you can actually trace it back to about 1985 when some of the original uh, cryptographers and cypherpunks started uh, emailing each other saying, hey, we've got this new internet thing. Is there any way that we can create uh, you know, an internet form of money? And they worked on that problem for decades and decades, and there are hundreds and hundreds of failed projects. Uh, Digicash, eGold, uh, uh, BitGold, um, that d ended up not working and falling apart over those decades because they were all centralized. They, they all required like a single entity to uh, essentially oversee the system and make sure that the system uh, was not compromised. Uh, the result of which being that that was a single point of failure and eventually the system fell for one reason or another. So the cypherpunks, uh, their legacy continues. There are many people such as myself who pick up their ideals and continue to, to work on making the system better, uh, make it easier to use, make it safer to use, and uh, try to scale the system up to meet the global demand. I believe that it's inevitable, possibly not in the United States, but any number of countries in the coming years will continue to have financial crises. Citizens in these countries will continue to be uh, irreparably harmed by the policies of their banks and their governments. And that as a result, millions if not billions of people out there will see that they have a need for a system like this that is uh, outside of the control of a small number of people. So my summary, I guess, of, of all of this is that trustless computing on blockchain-based systems is going to have an enormous impact upon the world. We're building this technology that allows us to create a world where you can buy goods and services without a merchant. You can place bets without a bookie. You can buy insurance without an underwriter. You can access finance and loans without a central bank. 
You can trade without an exchange. You can purchase commodities without a broker. You can create and enforce contracts without lawyers. You can create assets without an issuer. Secure escrow without an agent. Securely store data online without a hosting company. Verify records without a notary. Establish reputation and credit without a credit agency. And create identity without a government. So if you want to dive down this rabbit hole, check out uh, my website there, bitcoinsig.com, for a list of educational resources that can keep you busy for several months. And uh, I've also got a couple of different meetups that I run here in the Triangle. Uh, the first one is just more enthusiast, non-technical, high-level uh, discussion of current events. And the second one is more technical of like how do we apply this new technology to create uh, business opportunities.